Well, welcome to the show, Dave. Thank you very much for having me, Brian. It's great to be here. You know, it wouldn't be business with beers if I didn't ask you that me and you are at your favorite bar uh, up, in, up in Canada. Uh, what would we be drinking? Well, right now I'm on a skinny campaign. So unfortunately, I would be having club soda. But if I wasn't on a skinny campaign, then I would be joining you with either a Molson Canadian or a Stella Artois. Okay. Yeah, that sounds sounds right. So uh, if, if you could, for the audience, share kind of who you are and uh, you know what you do and, and your backstory, and we'll go from there. All right, perfect. So I'm a real estate guy uh, up here in Canada. Been in the real estate business one way or the other since 2003. I'm also a marketer. And these days, I personally focus more on passive investing, usually in multifamily properties. And my main business is I help other what I call mom and pop real estate entrepreneurs get started in the whole process of raising capital. So once they've hit the wall, they run out of cash, they run out of credit. What do we do next? That's where we help people get started. And the reason I'm, I'm passionate about this, Brian, is because uh, back in the day when I first started raising capital, I failed miserably. <laughs> I sucked wind big time. I had a very painful personal experience of of buying into the whole, hey, find a good deal and the money will find you. Okay. You know, yeah. BS that we've heard. And uh, it, it really didn't work for me. So I thought, you know what? There's gotta be a better way. So why don't I apply what I understand about marketing? And instead of chasing after investors, once I've got a deal, why don't I figure out how to attract investors to me before I've even got a deal? And that way I can go out and start making offers and tying up properties with confidence because I know I've got the capital to back me up. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. So, yeah. so your background is you were a real estate investor. You went to uh, actually raise capital yourself. So you, you learned this process somewhat self-taught through uh, kind of like- Yeah, I, 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 I learned it through the school of hard knocks and then got knocked around and went and took a whole bunch of training and courses and whatnot and realized a lot of that was all around, hey, just get better at dialing for dollars, get better at schmoozing, get better at networking, get better at this stuff. And I didn't particularly want to. So I thought, why don't I figure out how to make some marketing work for me and do it that way instead? Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah so do you, if you don't mind, can you walk us through um, kind of at a high level what, what that looks like? Um, for, sure. For somebody happy to raise to. money happy for the to. first time, maybe. Yeah. So again, you guys, you got to think if, if you're just getting started with raising capital, where's the best place to start? And in my, my opinion, the best place to start is with the low-hanging financial fruit, right? And the low-hanging financial fruit is within your own sphere of influence, people that you already have a pre-existing yep. relationship with, friends, family members, coworkers, business associates, etc. So Brian, one of the big mistakes I see people making, I'm sure you've seen the same thing, especially when it comes to raising capital, is they figure everybody and anybody with a pulse could be a pr prospective investor. And that's a big mistake for two reasons. Number one is logic. I mean, think about it. If you're trying to get somebody to invest 50 or 100,000 with you, they're going to need to know you, like you, and trust you with their money. Yep. If you're going out to strangers, they don't know you, they don't like you, and they sure as heck do not trust you with their 50 or $100,000. So that's, you know, that's a tough sell. And then the second big challenge is this pesky little entity that you guys have in the States called the Securities and, Ex Securities and Exchange Commission. Mm -hmm. I think each state has its own version of that as well. So you got a double whammy, federal and state level as well. Up here in Canada, we got the same thing. Each province has its own regulatory authority. And they all basically say the same thing. And that is that it's illegal for us to raise money from the general public unless we're licensed to do so. So yep. like a stockbroker or financial planner or mortgage broker in certain cases, or in, unless we've set up the proper legal structure, that could be an offering memorandum, that could be a certain corporate structure with exemptions and this kind of stuff. And quite frankly, Brian, for a lot of people getting started, that's a big financial hurdle to, to overcome. So fortunately, uh, in most cases, we are able to raise capital from friends and family members and, and stay within the rules and regulations. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. 100%. Yeah. So step number one is let's create a target group of these people that we already have that pre-existing relationship with, and then let's break the ice with them first before we start talking business. Because another 
big mistake I made early on, Brian, was I, I had that great deal in my lap. I tried the dialing for dollars, failed. I tried schmoozing and networking, failed. I got desperate. I got smart and I did create a list of a couple hundred people, but I, I was desperate. So I just kind of sent out my deal and said, hey, everybody, I've got this great deal. Have you got any cash? Mm-hmm. And that didn't go over very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could definitely see that. Uh, <laughs> 2020 yeah. hindsight, right? So here's a better step. The better step is create that list, mm-hmm. have a couple hundred people in there, and then break the ice with them efficiently via a, an automated email campaign and do that before you start talking business. So we've got a little, very simple three-step process that we talk about there called the warm-up campaign. You can, beautiful thing is you can use an email autoresponder system. You can set it up once, send it out to everybody all at the same time. And then your job is just really to connect with people and, and go back and forth a little bit on email. What, so what's um, what's an example of how you break the ice? Well, here's what, you know what, I, you're way too young to, to remember this kind of stuff, Brian, but back before the interwebs used to exist, people used to actually write letters to stay in touch with each other. and and. And way, way back when I was a kid, my aunt Nadine was awesome at writing an annual Christmas letter where she kind of caught us all up on what the family's been up to. We want to do a modern day version of that. You don't have to wait till Christmas. But basically, it's just like a nice, long kind of a catch up email. Hey, Brian, chances are it's been a while since we connected. Just want to let you know, say hi and let you know what I've been up to. Blah, 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 blah. Here's what I'm up to. Here's what the family's up to, the kids, the spouse, the what's going on with work. Here's the good stuff, the not so good stuff. Here's what's been going on with COVID. And keep it very friendly. Keep it very, you know, we're not trying to subliminally seed anything about real estate investing or anything like that. It's like it, it's like if you're writing a letter to an old friend. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you're going to print this sucker out, it'll be about a page long maybe. But the important thing is that you've got a call to action at the end of it. You'd say, hey, Brian, well, that's enough about me. How about you? How are you doing? I'd love to reconnect. Please, 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 please just hit reply to this email and let's catch up. Send that out to a couple hundred people. Don't worry. You're not going to get a couple hundred responses. Uh, You'll probably get somewhere in the 10 to 15, 20 response kind of range. And then make sure you have a little bit of a back and forth with those people because there is capital in those reconnections. Okay. So you get them reconnected. And at some point you're through the dialogue, you let them know. You're in the real estate business now. Yeah, yeah, very good right. point. So we have we actually have three steps to this reconnection campaign. The first two are just warm and fuzzy, and you know, here's what I'm up to and that kind of stuff. The third one is what I call the transition message, and that's where we switch gears, right? And it goes something like this. Uh, I, I usually prefer to do a video message for this, short and sweet, about a minute long. It'd be something like, "Hey, it's Dave. It's been really good reconnecting with you over the last week or so. I want to let you know that moving ahead." I plan on doing a much better job of staying in touch and letting you know what I'm up to with real estate investing. Real estate is something I'm very passionate about. I'm doing really well with it. And in fact, I think real estate is the best way for everyday folks like you and like myself to make an above average return on our money backed by a solid, tangible asset, real property. And who knows, maybe sometime in the future, you might even want to partner with me in a deal and share in the profits. But if you're really not into real estate investing, that's okay too. You can always click unsubscribe at the bottom of any of my emails. You'll be taken off my list immediately. My feelings will be hurt for a little while, but I'll get over it. All right. And in the meantime, if you haven't had a chance, please hit reply to this email and let's catch up. Okay. Send that sucker off to all 200 people. Okay. And then from there, you, you see what kind of response and then, you, then you're bringing them into your you know, more serious well, then, conversations. Then, yeah. So then that's step number one of our five step process. Let's create that list, break the ice with them first, kind of set the stage for everything that's coming. Uh, the next step of the process is even though, even though that warm up's really not designed to get you meetings, it might happen. So you got to be pre- prepared. And what I always recommend people have is a, is a, a well organized slideshow presentation that they can walk prospective investors through about their deals, right? Because uh, a big mistake I see some people making, Brian, is a lot of us real estate investors tend to be analytical numbers kind of people. Mm -hmm. And we're really enthusiastic about real estate. And we forget that the vast majority of the the population is not like us. Yep. (laughs) Have you ever had that? Where you're chatting with somebody that's outside of the real estate space and you're trying to talk about real estate and it's like, 
Yeah, you're talking them. about IRRs or equity multiples or oh God, you know yeah. LPs, GPs, and all this stuff. And he- heaven help us. Yeah, heaven yep. help us. Are trying to explain yep. the cap rate and all that good stuff. So, a couple of things we got to remember. Number one, the other person is probably not super analytical. Number two, the other person is probably not a real estate weirdo like us. Mm-hmm. Number three, they probably don't want to be. So what we all want to do is we want to simplify it. We want to make it Reader's Digest level. That's an old magazine that uh, yep. was written for grownups, but it was written at a 13-year-old reading level. Same idea with our presentation. Keep it, keep it pretty simple, easy to follow, and don't get bogged down in the details. So that's step two. Make sure you're ready to go with a presentation. And then step number three, that's where we kick things into gear with marketing. Uh, this is really, really important, Brian, as you know, because you're a business and real estate enthusiast. Without the marketing, nothing happens. So the warm-up campaign is actually kind of the first kick of the can with marketing. So we want to get top of mind and we want to stay top of mind with our target group of prospective investors. And that's through constant, consistent, what I call edutaining marketing. So a little bit educational, not much, don't get carried away. Uh, Hopefully a little bit entertaining and very, very consistent. So that's coming out on a regular basis. And and some of the things that we do for our clients is we'll get them set up with a investor focused website. And then we'll have, you know, first week of the month, their electronic newsletter goes out to their entire database. Okay. Next week, they got a blog post that goes out to their entire database. Week after that, perhaps it's a video log goes out to their entire database. Okay. Week after that, another blog post. And then same thing the next month. So once a week, drip, drip, drip. They're getting a little bit of edutaining marketing. Each piece of marketing has a specific call to action. Hey, if you'd like to find out more, click on the button. Let's jump on a call and see if this might be a good fit for you. Does that make sense, Brian? Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. And do you, do you guys help them with the content creation or how, how does yeah. that work? Yeah, for sure. So we, that, that's what my business is. We're kind of a boutique marketing agency. We work with mom and pop real estate investors and we help them implement all of this. And most of our clients are not uh, business people per se already. They're, they're part-time real estate investors. They typically still have their job. They're still doing whatever they do. Um, so we help them get all of this stuff set up so they don't have to, they can focus on the most important things, which is managing their portfolio, growing their portfolio and talking with investors. Yep. Okay. All right. So we got the marketing, we're educating them, we're entertaining them on a regular basis. And then is that, uh, and then what's the, that's the fifth, the fifth step. Well, that's, um, that's the third. Yeah. So the next step, actually, we're on to the fourth one now is demonstrating your credibility and authority. Yep. Right? Now, this is something a lot of people have a hang up about. They say, you know what, Dave, I don't have a ton of deals under my belt. I've only done one or two or maybe three deals. Am I ready? Am I worthy of raising capital? My answer is if you've got even one successful deal under your belt, then yes, you are ready and worthy of raising capital. The challenge is, is that, that a lot of people watch podcasts like yours and they hang out at real estate investment clubs and they hear about all these rock stars that have done dozens, if not hundreds, and in some cases, thousands of deals. And they think they need to be there before they can start raising capital. That ain't how it works. You got to start raising capital in order to get there. Yep. Does that make sense? So here's an interesting statistic. Take it for what it's worth, because we've all heard you know, about statistics. But I've heard uh, that 95% of the general population has never purchased a revenue property in their lives. Their own house does not count. All right. I'm talking about a, re- a rental property, a revenue okay. property. Okay. So if you've got even one successful deal under your belt, you're already ahead of 95% of the non real estate people that you know. So yep. you're, you're, you're way, way ahead of them. So you got to own that. You don't need to be seen as the next Robert Kiyosaki with a gazillion selling, best selling book type thing to be seen as an authority. All we want to do is we want to be seen as the go to real estate investor in the eyes of our couple of hundred prospective money partners. Does yep. that make sense? Yeah. And like, you know, I like to say that, you know, everyone starts somewhere. Right. Yeah. So for these, these people, even, even, you know, Grant Cardone, he's doing these billion dollar deals. You know, he, he started with, with one deal, right. That he had to raise his first time. And 
I think, you know, a lot of people have, have this like fear, right? The fear that if I try, I will fail or fear of embarrassment or, you know, but, but there's this, there's this polar opposite, right? That if they try, they could be wildly successful and that they could help. Well, and, they, and you can pretty much guarantee you won't be wildly successful until you try. Right? That's right. That's yep. That's yep. Much the way world, the world works. Yep. And yeah, the, the whole thing about failure, that, that is a big hang up for a lot of us, right? In one way, one area or another, we're always afraid of being embarrassed, looking, looking foolish, looking like a doofus. Um, and there's a risk of that with anything. However, that's one of the things I kind of like about this process is when you do things right, you can actually get people to put up their hand and approach you instead of you chasing after them. And then that risk of failure, that risk of embarrassment, that risk of of rejection is minimized because we're getting them to come to us instead of us chasing after them. Does that make sense, Brian? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's definitely- the whole goal think, of marketing, right? Yep, yeah, part of it is, is, is uh not maybe having as much of that rejection. Like I said, if, if you're cultivating, you know, a group of people who, who are interested in, uh, you know, investing in the financial freedom that it brings. So. Yeah, exactly. We get them to come to us. Fantastic. Yeah, so that's, that's step number four. So some different ways to be seen as an authority, even if you don't have a gazillion deals on your belt, some easy ones. Let's start with the easy ones. Dress the part. Okay. So what I always tell my clients is even if you're meeting with a prospective investor via Zoom, dress up a bit don't be don't be a slob right i mean you yep. even go as far as put on the the blazer and, and dress up it's going to give them respect it's going to get you respect as well speak intelligently about your strategy and your market be able to dumb it down simplify it have sharp looking materials you know your website should look professional uh, your business cards should look very very professional don't cheap out on those and just your, your different marketing assets, make sure that they, that they look good and they reflect nicely on you. Those are some really okay. easy ones and really smart one, like do exactly what you're doing. You know, if you want to get to that stage, start your own podcast or good ideas to get started is to get interviewed on other people's podcasts that automatically kind of positions you as an expert as well. Yep. Yep. And then also, you know, writing, I, I hear uh, people contributing to bigger pockets, you know, writing, writing articles about you know what they're doing or topics that they know or, or starting their own newsletter yeah. right it's kind of letting people know you know you have all this knowledge and experience and even if it's just a few right you you still you still have a story that you've learned and it's it's letting other people know about that which yeah, uh, put that up on your own website and let your yep. own people know about that that you've been featured on yeah you know, the beers podcast or you've yep. been featured on yep. bigger pockets or something like that yeah right. starting a podcast i mean it costs like 200 bucks whatever the microphone some headphones and you know you, you start to talk to local investors and you know, you, you, and then you learn from it. You know, that's the reason I started is talk to other, you know, smart uh, people like yourselves, and, and it's a great learning experience. And um, you know, networking, and you build it from there. So, exactly. Um, yeah, but but takes work. You got to take action, right? It's not going to happen on its own just by sitting behind your computer. You got to got to get out in the world and and do it. Like my friend friend Ted Thomas says, you can't get anywhere just sitting on your rusty dusty. <laughs> <laughs> I even know what that means, but that's, yep, uh, that's yep. a good thing. <laughs> but, uh, awesome. So, so we got, uh, you build, get their existing relationships. Step two, you simplify. Step three, you market to, to get more interest, right? Step four, you, you obviously have to have credibility and authority. What's, what's the fifth step? Well, the fifth step is once you get one or two investors under your belt, Brian, it's so much easier to get more of them because you're going to start the snowball effect if you're smart, right? Yep. So what does that mean? That means getting really good testimonials ideally video testimonials and number two getting warm introductions to your investors friends and, and sphere of influence right because they tend to hang out with other people yep. who could be really good prospective investors so once you get even one or two investors uh, under your belt and you're doing a good job with them and they're happy then it's much much easier to expand your investor network yeah yeah i, I mean i could speak to that i've you know, I've invested passively in, in a couple deals and it was through uh, referrals of, hey, this is a good operator. Because, uh, you know, the, the biggest fear from the investor standpoint, right, is, is the trust factor, yeah. right? That, you know, a good operator can still probably make money with a, with a bad deal, but a bad operator could totally mess up, you know, a really good deal, Great right? Deal. And um, and so you, you got to be able to trust them, right? And there's still this asset at the end, but, you know, um, it could take years to get your, your, your money back and it could be, you know, you could have no return at the end of it. So... If it's bad, right, you're absolutely right, Brian. Right. That trust factor is huge. And here's what happened: like you got referred to somebody from a friend. Yep. 
your friend did you a massive favor in more than one way. Not only did they refer you to a good uh, partner to partner up with, but they saved you so much time yep. having to do all the due diligence and figure everything out on your own. You're, you're piggybacking on their pre-existing relationship. Yep. And, they, and they invested in it and I, I trust them. So, I mean, I, you know, for this person to, for me to invest, I mean, it took like a couple, it took a week, right? It was, it was a short timeline. It wasn't this whole month because, you know, all that trust was kind of established and transitioned, you know, from the person that I know is, a, is an extremely successful investor to this person. And um, right. I even got my, 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 my brother got in the deal as well. So, you know, it really does snowball uh, if for, for high quality people who have a proven track record and, um, you know, that, that you have this, this trust factor. So yeah. That's, exactly. a, that's a great you one and you probably the most one. important. You, yep. you don't need a huge track record, just one, that one good deal that, that your investor is really happy with. So, okay. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And so what, what of, of all these steps, where do you think people get like hung up the most? Like what's, what's the biggest challenge and where do they get stuck? Well, they get, well, they get stuck in all the steps, <laughs> but the biggest one is the first one, right? The first step, because a lot of people say, uh, they got all sorts of excuses. I don't know very many people. That's a, that's a big excuse that I hear. And, and I say, you know what, if, if you're trying to think up 200 people, yeah, that's going to be tough. So what we always suggest is let's simplify it. Instead of starting with 200 people, trying to think up 200 people, start with 2000 and whittle it down to 200 people. People say, Dave, I don't know 2000 people. Yeah, you probably do. Export all your contacts from your cell phone, get them into an Excel spreadsheet export all your social media contacts, get them into an Excel spreadsheet, export all your email contacts, get them into that Excel spreadsheet, and then whittle it down to 200 people. It's much, much more efficient, much faster. So that's hang up number one. The other, the other hang up around that is they say, well, Dave, everybody I know is broke. Nobody's got any money. Nobody's going to invest with me. Again, that's an assumption. We know all know about assuming, right? It makes an ass out of you and me. And here's the thing. Uh, there was a book written years ago called The Millionaire Next Door, and they studied millionaires in North America. And they found out that the vast majority of millionaires don't look the way we think millionaires should look, right? Because Hollywood has this, uh, you know, this BS uh, impression of what millionaires look like. And then social media does all this bullshit about what, you know, wealthy people are just hanging yep. out in their Lambos and yeah. hot chicks all over the place and all this this stuff, right? The reality is most, the vast, vast, vast majority of, of North America's millionaires, you wouldn't know them because they're your neighbors. They drive the same kind of vehicle. They live in the same kind of house. They're just exceptionally good with their money. So never assume. Quite often the people that look all flash don't have any cash and the people that are much more modest actually do. So yeah. uh, I firmly believe that we all have at least one to $2 million in investor capital locked in with our within our current contacts we just have to figure out who they are and how to access it yeah the other objective i i would think that people have right is that is maybe they have money but it's all in a like a 401k or a retirement plan right and it's in the stock market uh but there there are ways right that the uh, they can they can unlock that and get them invested in their deal uh, can yeah, you speak to that a little bit self -di self-directed 401ks that's huge up here in Canada same idea with yep. we call them RRSPs same same thing basically so yeah it's, about, it's it, it all gets back to that edutaining marketing part of what we do is every once in a while about every 3 months we'll have our clients do an educational presentation a webinar to their list about something and that could be one of those topics is hey how to turn your underperforming 401k supercharge it Right. And then it, it's all about, hey, you know what? You can take control of this. You can create a self directed account. You can invest in what you want to. Here's a big benefit of investing in real estate. Right. And then you, you yep. go on. So you open their minds about that. So, what do you see when people are they're doing this first deal? How, how much are they typically trying to raise? And then I well, guess, and in, in what, I mean, I know there's a range, right? But, you know, your average client, your median client, well, it really depends on where they're located and what they're doing, Brian. So uh, if we got Canadian clients, unfortunately for us, our property prices up here tend to be stupid. I mean, the average price of a single family home across the country is getting close to half a million dollars. And that's just for a house, for crying out loud. So, oh, wow. yeah. um, so you know, they're, they're having to raise, you know, hundred to $150,000 just for the down payment on, on a house. 
Uh, we got American clients that they can buy three houses for that that kind of money. You know, so it it really depends. It's all across the board. But typically, what I usually recommend is that we're looking for investors who can invest at least one hundred thousand dollars without it being a huge stretch for them. That's that's my recommendation. People get freaked out about that and and whatnot, but it's not as hard as it sounds. And the reason I like that is because uh, the fewer cooks in the kitchen, the better. Like the fewer investors I need to do a deal, the better. The 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 less management headaches there are, the less reporting headaches there are, uh, the less cooks in the kitchen. So that's that's one of my recommendations: is minimum hundred thousand dollars per investor. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Because if it was twenty thousand or, or so, I mean that same, you could have five times as many people, right? As if well, was, here's the other challenge, at least 100. that I found, Brian, is when you get a twenty thousand dollar investor on board, typically that's their nest egg. That's everything they've got, and that twenty thousand dollar investor tends to be a much bigger pain in the butt than the hundred thousand dollar investor. Because a hmm. hundred thousand dollar investor, that isn't usually all the money that they have. That's part of what they got available. Um, so they, they tend to be much more pleasant to work with. Okay, great. Can you speak to me about your, your theory on kind of goal setting, right? Having clarity on, on goals that you're trying to achieve and tracking them on a regular basis is, is kind of a key to success. So maybe what's your personal philosophy? Kind of how do you set maybe goals for your, your personal business? Do you, do you go big, you know, like the 10 X theory, or are you kind of have this, like the incremental growth? Um, what do, what do you do? Yeah, well, I was kind of a slow, slow learner about goals. I mean, I've been aware of goals my entire life, but it's kind of like, uh, yeah, 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 kind of thing. Uh, over the last dozen years or so, I've definitely started paying a lot more attention to them. Now it's something that I've, I've got on the go on a regular basis. I I am a proponent of the 10, 10x philosophy, but not Cardone's version. Nothing against Cardone. He's great. He's fantastic. Uh, but he's got a certain kind of he's got he's got an incredible drive and personality not all of us have that right yep. i kind of like the 10 a 10 x philosophy of a gentleman named uh, uh dan sullivan who i'm okay. not sure yep. if you're familiar with right and his 10 x philosophy is yeah let's let's have these bigger goals but let's not try to cram that into 10 xing in the next year or two 10 x might look like five years that might look like 10 years it might look like 15 or 20 years give yourself some time to go into those goals but definitely yeah the the bigger goals that you set uh, the the more interesting your life is going to be okay what's what's your biggest goal you're trying to achieve now well right now i am on track to doubling our marketing agency business this year so i'm not 10 xing it but we are on track to okay uh two xing it there you go. And <laughs> how long have you been in business for this this business? Well, this particular business, we've been in business for five years, six years. Okay. This particular business. Uh, the pandemic has been very good for our business. Um, not so great for some other businesses, but it, it's, it forced yep. me to pivot and do everything 100% online instead of schlepping around the country on, pl- on planes and stuff like that. Like I yep. was doing before. Yeah, doing virtual meetings and virtual groups and education. It's all virtual workshops, virtual yep. training, virtual everything. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's been yep. great. You know, the other thing is, you know, successful people have a have a uh, ability to execute good habits on a daily basis. So there, are there any habits that you kind of attribute to, to your success or that you've you've seen others um yeah, consistently do? For sure. So one of the things I've started doing over the last year and a half or so is really tracking things a lot better. So Brian, I I don't know if you're familiar with this whole 75 hard thing. I've heard of it, yep. Yeah. So when the whole pandemic started, I was uh, 225 pounds of flab. I'm five foot eight, so uh, that was pretty, pretty pudgy, man. And the pandemic hit and I said, ooh, one of the risk factors is being fat and I'm definitely at risk there. So I had to lose some weight. So I heard about this, I had a friend of mine doing the 75 hard thing and I said, okay, well, why don't, why don't I try that? And part of the whole thing is you just gotta, you gotta follow up a whole yep. protocol. Could, could you explain it what, it, what it is for those who don't know? Well, it's, it's a weight loss slash mental toughness process. A guy named Andy Frisella came up with this 
and he's kind of a Grant Cardone kind of intense dude. Um, but basically, let me see if I remember everything because it's been a little while since I've done it. You'd think I would remember because I did it. Had, I failed the first time, so I had to do it twice. But basically, for 75 days, you have to do a series of things. Number one, you have to follow a strict diet to the letter. No cheat days, no cheat meals, no nothing. They don't tell you which diet. They just say pick one and mm. stick to it, right, for 75 days. Number two, you have to drink a gallon of water every single day. A gallon, okay. all right, okay. which if you're not used to drinking water, that is a ton of water, all right? Number three, you have to exercise 45 minutes twice a day. Once in the morning, once in the evening, doesn't matter what it is, but one of those times must be outside no matter what's going on in the weather. Okay. All right. So got to remember, I live up here in Canada. I started this in January. Not a fun time to start it, but anyhow, so that's it. Another thing is no booze. Yep. So no alcohol for those 75 days. And the one that tripped me up is, uh, oh no, there's another couple. Uh, you have to read, uh, can't remember, it's uh, 10 pages from some sort of a self-development business type book every single day. And the one that tripped me up on a regular basis was you have to take a selfie of yourself you know, with your shirt off mm -hmm. to show your progression every single day. And the first time I'd started doing this, I, I made it to day 42 and forgot to take the damn selfie. And then if you, if you miss any one of those things, it resets on day one. Man, so, I mean, that takes a huge, right? Commitment of, of yourself, right? And being honest with yourself that, Hey, I, I missed this selfie or I had this, I think it's no sugar too. You know, you had this candy bar or this drink. Um, exactly. I mean, so it's, it's that discipline. How, how do you, you know, how do you do well, it? That's, that was the biggest benefit for me, man, was, you know, at age 51, um, realizing that this is the equivalent of me going through a, a pretty mild version of a boot camp, right? You know, the guys that go through boot camp in the military, yeah. they they develop discipline very, very quickly. Well, how do you get this as a as a person who's never been through that? This is this is kind of something that's self-imposed. And I can remember it very, very vividly, Brian, when I got to that when I realized I missed my damn selfie, all the, the self-talk that goes in is like, okay, well, screw it. I'll go have fun for a week. I'll, I'll, I'll have a bunch Get of, you on a, on a, a bender. Yeah. I'll go on a bender. Yeah. Cause you yeah. know what? Worst thing was I was, I was traveling for a conference. So I was out there, everybody's drinking and having a good time. There I am behaving myself. And then I forget that. So I, I was very, very tempted, uh, but I didn't, I said, if I do that, I know I'm going to go off the rails. I won't get back on track. So what I did is, okay, I've failed this one, but I'm not going to start over on day one just yet. I'm going to, I'm going to continue along, but I'm not going to claim victory. So then I got to the end of the first 75 days and said, okay, I screwed that one up. Let's do it again. I think I did give myself two weeks off. And then I started again on day one and I was actually able to finish it the second time around. Okay. And are, are, have you continued any of those habits that you did yeah, throughout so it? That got, so what I figured out there, that gets back to the tracking. I figured out, Hey, you know what? In order, in order not to forget this stuff, I've got to I've got to keep a journal. I've got to I've created a spreadsheet and I check things off every day. So that way I didn't forget to take the damn selfie. I, I made sure that I was drinking my gallon of water, and, and I found that that was really effective for me. Is if I track everything on a spreadsheet, like actually yep. print it out and, and do it by hand, then yep. uh, it keeps me on track, and that's been a huge huge benefit for me, not just personally, but business wise as well. Okay. Yeah. There's a really good book, uh, atomic habits. I don't know if, if you've read it. Yeah, but, I have. I've read it. Um, yeah, you know, he has the habit tracker, just simple. Sim I mean, it's a simple grid, right? You just check it off. And the idea is that the repetitious, you know, nature of it and, and, and you forget things, right? You're busy. And especially when you're trying to build new habits, that that's, that's key. So, um, yeah, so that's is. a great experience for you. Um, Talk to me about your, you know, so you have a marketing company, right? You have a bunch of clients. Talk to me about kind of the process. How do you, how do you leverage your time to be able to scale this thing? And, and you know, you said double your business over the last year. Yeah. Um, it's a virtual assistance. Is it, what kind of systems and processes are in place? Oh, yeah. No, I've, I've, I used to be kind of a one guy show with a VA. Uh, now I'm a one guy show with uh, six or seven VAs and, and some, uh, some outsourcers that I work with very, very closely. 
so that's how I've been able to grow it. I mean, I've, I've had different businesses in the past with full-time employees and office buildings and that kind of stuff. I don't want to go there again. Uh, so I love this whole ability to work with a virtual team. Then it doesn't really matter where I am, where they are, where the client is. We're able to do everything via Zoom and online. Okay. So you built this kind of 100% virtual you know, marketing company, right? And that yeah. all, all your, your staff, and we have a number, I have six or seven VAs that work for me for different businesses. And, you know, they're, they're, they're great. You know, they're, they're, they're smart and they, they really care. And, you know, for us, they're, they're full-time employees, you know, of our business. And, um, you know, it really helps kind of leverage our time to, to focus on the highest value tasks. So, definitely. Yeah, um, definitely. And then the other thing that I've done is the, the way we do our business is we, we try as much as possible to go one to many. So we have people that come through uh, any number of different funnels and then they come to a full one day workshop where instead of me trying to sell them a, a home study course, I deliver them the entire training in that very low cost workshop. And then we offer them our done for you services as the the, the offering, right? The big red. Easy okay. Button, so you, you tell them what, here's all the things you need to do. Set up the website, create and this here's how campaign. Here's yeah. how to do it. Right. And then, so you either can go and find vendors and do it yourself, or, you know, they can work with, with you guys. That's your exactly. kind of value add uh, position on that. Yeah. That's, that's our business. Exactly. Okay. We'll do those. And so the pandemic has been great. And from that state standpoint, because before I was flying around the country doing workshops here, there, and all over the place, now we do them online via zoom so twice a month like clockwork ding ding we've got these workshops going on uh so we were constantly adding more value to people and also constantly able to bring on new clients that way that's great that's awesome um i know you've written a, a number of books uh, besides your books uh what anything you're reading now that you've you recommend yeah tons i'm i'm a i'm a big reader um so speaking of dan sullivan this one, this yeah, is not, great. Who not, not how. how? Yep, it's a great. That book. is a great book. Highly recommend it. And um, this one, Profit First. Yep, you, uh, that's a great book. One? one of my favorite as well. Yep. Yeah, I absolutely love this book. So those are the two. I'm going through uh, Joe Fairless's best ever apartment syndication book right now. So I've always got something different on the go. Uh, but one of my favorite books of all time, business wise, is The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. Okay, I haven't heard of that one. What's what's it about? It's about sales and marketing. Yeah, but okay. it's it, the, for me at least the way he he goes through it is just so uh, easy to grasp. I mean, I, I've been studying and uh, a student of marketing for decades now, but just his uh, his book is just an amazing synthesis of of information. Fantastic, um, great! Well, I think you've you know delivered a ton of value. You know, your your five step program here is great. How how can listeners kind of connect and, and learn kind of more about you, or if they're interested in you know further education or your services? Yeah. So what I would recommend is if people really want to take a deep dive into this, if you're ready to start raising capital for your real estate deals, well, come spend a day with us. Like I said, we do these virtual workshops. At this point, we're doing them uh, usually twice a month. And you can go to, it's simple enough, investorattractionworkshop.com. And then if you put in this handsome guy's name, Beers, you got the best last name ever, my friend. Uh, you put that that uh, name in there, Beers, all caps, that will get you a 50% discount on the ticket, courtesy of Mr. Brian Beers. Fantastic. Well, it was great uh, getting to meet you and, and having you share your knowledge. And uh, you know, thanks again for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Brian. All right. Thanks, Dave.